So my name is Lina Rodriguez Salamanca. Uh, I am a plant pathologist and diagnostician with the Plant and Insect Diagnostic Clinic. So I love mushrooms and I also help out when people send me samples to ID mushrooms that may be causing problems on uh, trees in the landscape. So let me see here. So let's go right to it. Uh, today, I want to tell you a lot about morels and how can you distinguish them uh, from false ones, false morels. So what are morels? Morels are mushroom producing fungi in the genus Morchella. Uh, only true morel mushrooms belong to that genus, to Morchella. While false morels belong to an other genera. Let's see here for a minute. Mor Morchella species are rated excellent for eating. And no Morchella species is known to produce produce any toxins. However, some people may become intolerant or sensitive to Morchella species. So what are the basics of Morel's anatomies? We have a cap and a stem. Lots of mushrooms do have this anatomy too, while others have uh, different pieces that make them different. So what makes a true morale a true morale? A couple things. The first one would be a pitted honeycomb sponge-like cap, like this photo in here. Hopefully you're seeing that. Hope you can see my cursor. So you got this pits in here on the cap. The other important characteristic is that the cap is fused to the stalk. So it keeps the stem attaches to the cap right at the bottom of the cap. And number three, both cap and stalk are completely hollow. And that is very, very important. Sometimes in mycology books or online, you may see this term intergrown. And what that means is that the cap is fused to the stalk. So think of them as like old fashioned uh, light bulbs that are kind of continuous here from where they connect to the electricity to what emits the light. So when we name organisms in, in uh, biology, we use what we call Latin binomials uh, and those get kind of cumbersome they're Latin, so sometimes they're harder to pronounce. So for mushrooms, we use a lot of common name or nicknames. So to give you an example, for humans, our Latin binomial is Homo sapiens, and Homo is the genus. Or if you see a, a, a parallel here, it could be a first name. And that species or last name is, is that species, right? So how do that connect with those nicknames? Well, uh, Dr. T here uh, and uh, Amorel, I'm gonna use this parallel to explain it. So Dr. Louise Tiffany uh, was a famous mycologist here in Iowa State um, and she loved uh, Morales. And in fact, she has a really nice publication from the 90s uh, on Morchella species and other species of mushrooms in Iowa. And so one of the, more else that we have in Iowa is Morchella Americana. So when it comes to nicknames, Dr. Louis Tiffany was known as the mushroom lady in Iowa. And the nickname for this Morchella Americana would be the yellow morel. So what are the species of morels that we have in Iowa and most likely in Nebraska? Um, Morchella Americana, Morchella angusticipis and Morchella punctipis. And we're gonna go through each of them so that you get to be familiar with them. So Morchella americana, this one is known or its nickname is yellow morel, white morel or gray morel. 
this one used to be called different last names or different species. Um, Morchella esculentoides, Morchella esculenta, Morchella crassipis, or Morchella deliciosa. And all the species were kind of lumped together um, some years ago when some uh, mycologists starting to ask questions about the relationship of all these different species that were described. And then with DNA technology, just like we you know, were to collect our DNA and send it to uh, that swab from your mouth and send it to uh, Ancestry.com or, or any service like that, they compare those different uh, species and they come up to realize that they were all the same species and they were grouped and reclassified as Morchella americana. Morchella americana is normally associated or in um, forest areas uh, that have ash, uh, trees, dead or dying elm trees, aspens, balsam poplars, sycamores, tulips, and apple trees. As far as the proportion, the cap and the stem, for the most part, the ratio is one to one, a very similar uh, size. But in some cases, you'll have a longer stalk. Um, it really can vary. So Morchella americana can be a little more on the yellow end of things, like this photo on the left a little lighter, the one in the middle, or it could be a little gray in color. Therefore, they're uh, common nicknames, yellow morel, white morel, or gray morel. Now let's move to Morchella angusticipis. This one is known as black morel. It's normally associated or present in forests that have aspen, white ash trees, and for the most part, that cap is narrow, uh, cone shape with a long, narrow pits. And the pits are um, very distinctive because they have black ridges. Therefore, they're nicknamed Black Morel. This, could, this mushroom could be up to six inches in height. And uh, the stalk is tan to grayish, and it tends to have a flaky surface. Now, we also have half-free morels. And the ones that we have in the Great Plains and eastward is the half-free morel, Morchella punctipis. And this one can be, can be a little bit cumbersome to identify. And it's the one that I will warn you to be most cautious about because it looks like um, one that can be poisonous and there's a false morel. So we'll go through how they are uh, similar and how do they differ so that hopefully you get a better idea on how to recognize these two look like mushrooms and, um, and we'll ask some questions about it. So Morchella punctipis, you can see that this one has a very particular look when you compare it with uh, the, the gray morel uh, or the black morel. As I said, it's a half-free morel. It has in common with the black morel that it has a spotted stem. Uh, the term that you may find uh, online or in books is, is chromolose. And for the most part, the, lar the stem is larger. It's, it's a tall morel that has a shorter cap. And the proportion is three to one. So it's a lot a shorter cap compared to any of the other morels that we just covered. So when you see it without necessarily splitting it, you may not be convinced it's a true morel or a morchella species. And so often myself, when I'm hunting, I need to split this ones because I don't wanna make, I wanna make sure that I'm not bringing something poisonous home. And something to look for here on this half morel is that that cap, it's attached to the stem roughly quarter to half of the length of that cap. And so I have several examples in here. You can see this one is halfway. Now this one, it's almost uh, two thirds in there. And if you get a close up, you can see that rule that I told you at the very beginning that, that is true for Morchella americana and Morchella angusticipis is broken here. 
because that stem does not attach right at the base, but instead halfway. Something important is that the, the cap is uh, conical, like an inverse cone, um, that it's a lot more pronounced than with the other morcellas that we saw before. Now, the only way to determine if a mushroom is edible or poisonous is to identify it correctly. And there's lots of good resources that you can use to learn how to do this. Um, and my favorite one is to get friends that know what they're doing, experts. Uh, there's a lot of mushroom clubs that you can join. Lots of great books, looks at, great of, uh, uh, lots of good talks and, and webinars that you can uh, join. Um, because there is a lot of things that you want to make sure you're not taking any risks, any unnecessary risks for you or your family. Now, once you have deemed and identified that mushroom properly, you also have to keep in mind other practices that I'm going to go over. Because every year, a considerable number of poisonings continue to occur even by eating mushrooms that we consider edible and that were properly identified. And so I'm gonna go over why is that the case? Well, first, we need to have some information of the place that we are harvesting and hunting for mushrooms because some so soil or sites can be contaminated. And contamination could be from heavy metals uh, or other soil pollutants bioaccumulation of chemical compounds, engine exhaust, fungicides, or herbicides, like in lawns, for example. So we recommend to avoid highways, you know, ditches, golf courses, railroad tracks, any, of, any places that could be treated with chemicals. Old orchards, um, you know, back in the day, there was a lot of pesticides that where the norm and that later on we learned that we that those pesticides can persist in soils for a long time so we want to steer away from old orchards and any industrial sites um, there may be some chemicals in there that we don't want to be exposed to so what happens is that mushrooms they're not like plants in the sense that they're not able to produce their own food Mushrooms use what is available to them. Mushrooms and fungi in general are the recyclers of the natural world. They will take compounds that they will encounter in the forest and they have the enzymatic or the metabolic machinery to break down those compounds and use them as source of carbon and nitrogen. Very often, mushrooms also have uh, relationships with trees where they are kind of exchanging uh, different types of uh, nutrients. But because of their ability to be sponges and to collect materials that they recycle for their own nourishment, then these mushrooms are able to then accumulate heavy metals and any soil pollutants or pollutants in a particular area. So keep that in mind. Always make sure that you know you have some information on where you are collecting mushrooms. What else? Problems too, that people will collect morels but still um, suffer some uh, discomfort or a poisoning um, event is because they may not know how to cook them right. If you end up eating a raw mushroom, the cell walls of mushrooms are mainly chitin and this is a compound that's very difficult to digest. So we use uh, heat just like we do to cook beef or, or you know meat in general so that those compounds are broken and easy for us humans to digest. Likewise, if we are not cooking those mushrooms properly, some of those compounds are gonna be very hard to digest and what you may end up with is a very uh, harsh um, intestinal problem for at least a couple hours. And depending on your sensitivity, it could go downhill pretty quickly. The other problem, and this is especially true with black morels, when morels, um, black morels are mixed with alcohol, there is a lot of confirmed poisonings uh, in the Midwestern states where people actually identify 
the morale, the black morale properly. They took some pictures, they may have not eaten them all, or they ate par partially, um, you know, they hunt a lot, had lots of black morales, ate partially uh, their, their catch, and then got really sick, run to the emergency room, show the doctor the photo, then there is volunteer mycologists that um, through different states will help out uh, with poisonings. And a lot of those cases, those mycologists were able to confirm it was a black morel. And what it has in common is that people have a black morel, they cooked it and all, but it was mixed with alcohol. So be very careful. And now, the same way that some of us cannot have peanuts or um, can really tolerate wheat or very uh, rich sugars. Some people are the same way with morale mushrooms. And so some people may experience gastrointestinal symptoms. And I am one of those uh, individuals. I can only have a small amount of morels. Just my system cannot handle a big portion of them. Even though they've been well cooked and uh, identified properly, I have a lot of other problems that, uh, uh, or, um, you know, for example, watermelon, I cannot have watermelon. It's the same for me. I can have a lot of morels uh, or, for example, asparagus. They're hard for my system to break in down, so I know that I can only have a, a very small amount of those. What else is in your hands when it comes to being safe and handling, handling this mushrooms properly? Anything that you can do to reduce post-harvest contamination and any best harvesting practices that you can have in place will help you avoid any uh, events of poisonings or just gastrointestinal discomfort. Some things to consider. Uh, when you're harvesting, make sure that you are harvesting above the soil level because soil debris can and is an undesirable source of contamination. Sometimes that soil may get into the pits of the morales, and if that's the case, you may want to have a soft brush that you use to kind of like shake that dirt uh, out of the pits, but make sure that you're also cleaning the soft brush often. You can dip it in alcohol after you're done for the day. You can wash it with uh, soap, soapy water, well, uh, rinse it well, and take it with you as you're hunting. Problem is if you do not remove the soil from the base or from the pits, soil, it's a very uh, diverse ecosystem. It has a lot of bacteria, um, and bacteria just take advantage of, uh, you know, the, the morels, uh, and they can start decomposing the mushrooms in storage, um, in transit, well, you get from your hunting spot to home uh, or in the fridge. Well, they're still, you know, refrigerated, but this bacteria can be doing some damage to your morels. Now, what to keep your specimens as you're hunting? I recommend paper bags or wax paper. Um, avoid at all costs plastic bags. They increase humidity and they can be conducive to decay and contamination. And we do not want this neither in transit nor as you get them uh, to your place and, or they are refrigerated. Something important as you are harvesting, avoid over mature specimens or with signs of damage. So look for insert insect larvae, is there mold on the top, do they look slimy, anything. I have some examples in here. Be sure that you're not picking, uh, nor consuming old or rotten mushrooms. Uh, you may go out and say, oh, okay, yeah, all my mushrooms look good. You put them in your fridge, you forgot about them. Three days later, you're like, oh, my mushrooms. Well, they have, there's a chance that some decay happened during transit and in the fridge. So just be very careful and try and use them uh, and, and eat them fresh, eat those morels fresh. But as you are harvesting, keep in mind, look at them before you harvest them. Is there any signs of damage or the insect or larvae came through that this mushroom here, it's old and is starting to decay? I wouldn't even pick this guy. Now this one is full of ants and it also has some um, 
discoloration in there, I would not pick this guy there. This one has some fuss, uh, and this other one had some slime on it. None of the specimens are good, so be very picky about once you're going to commit to get one of those mushrooms out, look at them very well and say, okay, I'm going to go with this one. Because if you were to pick up one of this ones and put it with the rest and you're not packing them individually, you will be then contaminating the rest of the good ones. As I said before, make sure avoid at all costs plastic bags. Those will create uh, humid conditions that will cause your mushrooms, your morel mushrooms to really decay fast. What else? I'll recommend to keep the specimens packed separately, uh, even within morels, so that if you don't want to be as picky as, as you go and harvest, you can still keep them separately and with more calm at home in the kitchen with your kids or whomever you, you hunt with, uh, you can then look at them uh, and decide what are you cooking, what are you not cooking. Uh, and if you do it uh, as you hunt, uh, you can just, the way that I see it is I think, well, I leave this one for the deer and the wildlife. I don't, you know, this one is not good for me. They, they have better stomachs than I have. Now, if you're collecting other things, other types of mushrooms that are not morels, even more important than you keep them separate because you don't know, you know, some things you may rub different specimens. There is such a wild uh, range of sensitivity among people through to different mushrooms that so you don't want them touching and getting contaminated that way. Now, as you are hunting, keep your moral mushrooms away from direct sun or any warm or hot temperatures uh, and refrigerate soon after harvest. So lots of people may carry a, um, a good cooler, a good bucket with a lid, uh, some ice packs. Uh, I have heard of people saving um, those fruit, small fruit containers for strawberries or raspberries and they keep their, their uh, morels really well organized and kind of uh, stack on a, on a good bucket or a good um, beer cooler and that way you can keep them away from direct sun and hot temperatures. So once you um, collect a mushroom, a morel mushroom, and you're going to be eating it, it becomes food. And so once you're dealing with food, remember all personal hygiene practices that you will put in place when picking vegetables, when working in your garden, um, washing your hands, do not handling things as you're sick. All those things will be important, especially in the wild. You want to stay away and be very vigil vigilant about um, wildlife droppings. Uh, carcasses, avoiding flooding areas because sometimes flooding areas will come with fish mortality and some other wash off of uh, contaminants. So think of all of those things and there's a really good resource um, available in ISU uh, where you can just go through different lessons for food safety right here on this link. And above all, always remember you have to make sure that you're identifying this mushrooms properly. So now we're going to move into learning about those false morels. Unfortunately, those false morels are sometimes mistaken for true morels. And like I said, their nickname is very similar. So we're talking of false morels um, and they have morels on their common name but they are not morels. And these false morels will cause and can cause poisoning, anything from mild to severe. Um, there are poisoning incidents with false morels that happen every year in Iowa. And it is likely that more poisonings occur than are actually reported. Given the time that we have today, I am just gonna be focusing on the two that I'm most concerned burpa species and a couple of gyromyja species. And so what becomes problematic with those mushrooms is that um, when you look at the morchellas, most of them, depending on the season uh, and the year, um, not this year that we had uh, some late snow, that right now we have snow in the ground here in central Iowa, but for the most part, and depending on temperatures, humidity, um, and how flood, uh, is a uh, current or not, 
you may expect to start finding Morchella or true morels um, mid-March. The peak will then be the beginning, mid and early May for most of them, and then dwindling down late May and a little bit into June. It's all about the year that we have in terms of weather conditions. So the burpas, it's one of the false morels that I'll talk uh, about today. The one that I normally am concerned the most is the burpa bohemica because it does have a very similar look. Um, and those uh, you'll start seeing in April here. And those are unfortunately called the early morels, the burpa bohemica. But it is a false morel and it will cost you some trouble. The other ones I will be talking about is the gyromitra. We got the brunea, the carolumiana, and the sculenta. And some of them, again, early March, the carolumiana, not as common here in, in Iowa, but it could uh, be found. And then you see they do overlap quite a bit with the true morels, with the morcella species. I'm not covering helbellas. In my opinion, they look quite different, but they also don't overlap as much. Um, and so I'm not going to cover them in this class. All right, let's go then to burpas. This burpas are in Iowa, we have at least two species, conica and bohemica. I am going to be focusing on bohemica is the one that concerns me the most. And how can you uh, differentiate burpa from uh, true morels, from morcellus? Well, two good tips here is that their stalks are not hollow. There will be that cottony mass of white fungus inside the stem of burpa species. And the other very important, if you're not sure and you are on the, I have to do, do I actually have done this a couple of times where I was not sure and I said right here, as I'm hunting, I'm gonna check. Cut it in half, boy, this is a burpa is staying behind. I'm not even mixing it with the rest of my, my bounty. So, but that cap will be attached at the very top of the stalk. All right, burpa bohemicas. They're rare in Iowa. They are known as early morels. They are not true morels. And unfortunately, they're often mistaken for morcella punctipes. And that is the half free morel. They appear before and during the morel season. And the stalks have darker granules, um, a little bit of that squamatose look that the Morcella punctipes or the Morcella angusticipes have and black morel respectively have. So that makes it very confusing. They tend to have the ratio very similar to the Morcella americana or the Morcella um, angusticipes. So you know, it, it can get kind of uh, difficult to recognize them. But the big difference that I want you to notice in here is that the cap, there are not pits on it. This is more of a wrinkle look, and there are not pits that, and the pits are very characteristics of the Morcella, the true morels. Now, if you run into one of these ones, and you think, oh, I really think it is, I'm gonna take it with me, I advise you against it. Do not take any Burpa Bohemica with you because they are unsafe to eat. They will cause you a stomach upset uh, and they can cause some neurological problems. You may lose coordination. Um, there is this famous moral expert, Nancy Smith Weber, who grew up grew, um, you know, hunting with her family and remember vividly, uh, when they mistakenly had some burpa, her mother would walk into the wall instead of through the doorway because the type of poison that burpa has will mess up with your neuro neurological system. All right, so we're gonna do an exercise of looking side by side, true versus false morels. Here on green, we have Morcella punctipes, the true morel, the one that we call the half morel. Now let's look at the calves. We have pits on those caps. When we compare it with the false morale, the burpa bohemica, we have wrinkles. That is really, really important. Now let's say that you're not sure 
and right then and then you take your knife in the field and you decide to split it. If you run into true morels, either gray, like the Morchella americana, uh, or the Morchella angusticipis, the black morel, you would expect hollow stalks and hollow caps and both black morels and white morels will have that attachment of the cap right there at the base. You see, a kind of integral, we talked about this, they are fused. If you compare that with the, the half free morel, the cap is attached halfway in here to the cap. So you see an example there, an example on this one, and another example there. Now, when you compare that to the burpa, to the false morel, always remember, burpas, the cap will be attached at the very top of the stalk. So once again, always, if you are in doubt, split it in half or leave it behind. Don't take any risk with this burpa bohemica because they could get you in trouble and you don't want that gastrointestinal discomfort. Uh, that is not a very good thing to experience. All right, now let's talk about that other genus of false morels. This will be gyromitra. Uh, I'll start with gyromitra esculenta. Gyromitra esculenta is uh, known as a beefsteak morel or red morel. In my opinion, it look, look much different than true morels because again, those caps are wrinkled. So there's more like a folding or lobed. Uh, they tend to be brown to red uh, and the stalks are thicker. Normally they will have this frills or they'll be fluted, which is very different to the true Morcella species. And the stems are not hollow. Instead, those stems are chambered. So the good thing is that this particular gyromitra sculenta is not very common in Iowa, but you may uh, run into some of those. Another one, gyromitra brunea. This one is the most common species in Iowa, also very toxic. And unfortunately, they do overlap in time and location with true morels, with morchellus. The cap is brown. It's more of a saddle shape cap, wrinkled, and it could be two to five inches across. So it's, it's a pretty thick mushroom in general. Some people may run into problems if you happen to find a very young specimen that is just starting to emerge. And I think that's where the problem can come. Um, if you find them really young, then you may think, oh, this may be a true morel. But don't fall for it, split it in half, make sure that you check if the stem is hollow and the cap is hollow too. And another gyromitra here, that will be gyromitra curliniana, is larger, more rounded cap than the gyromitra brunea. This one is much less common in Iowa, and uh, the cap is more of a dark reddish to brown. You can see that here on the photo on the right. And I like this photo too, because you can kind of see one, the stem is not hollow on this one. Instead, it has like the strange chambers. And the same is true. You see the cap, it, it has like this locules in there. There's nothing in this cap that is hollow. Uh, the way that we expect the true morels, those more cellas, uh, to be. And this is a stalk that could be three to four inches long and that it definitely widens at the base. So are gyromitras unsafe to eat? Absolutely. They are poisonings. And the reason why is because gyromitras contain a toxin that is called gyromitrin. And if you eat one of those ones, that gyromitrin toxin in your body, once it hits your stomach, the acid in the stomach will make it into monomethyl hydrazine, which is actually the same as rocket fuel. So this could cause a very acute syndrome and you can get sick very quickly. Or if you happen to tolerate this mushroom in time, this uh, compound, the monomethyl hydrazine, is also known as uh, carcinogenic. So when you eat one of this uh, 
gyromitris, the damage that is expected is that it will destroy your red blood cells, it will poison your nervous system, and it will injure your liver and digestive tract, and it could even result into death. What are the symptoms of poisoning with gyromitrine? This could start from 6 to 12 hours, sometimes 36 to 48 hours, depending on the amount uh, that was consumed and also the year. Uh, the levels of toxin definitely uh, change from season to season and from person to person. Now you may start uh, feeling some nausea, cramps. Uh, you may start to puke and vomit. You may end up with some diarrhea, distension, that bloating feeling in your belly that is like you feel like a balloon almost. You may feel weak or fatigue. You may have a headache, jaundice, meaning that your liver is failing and your face start becoming all yellow. Even convulsions, sometimes a coma, and then all this could culminate into death. So can gyromitris be safe to eat? I would say absolutely not. Um, however, you will find other myths in the internet of people that are very uh, bold, uh, but it is not recommended and they're not safe to eat and you're taking a really big risk. Some people ask, can you boil it off? You know, that way that toxin will break and you'll be all good. Well, the problem is that the toxin is volatile. So as the mushroom may be boiling, the, 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 the steam, then it's available, like that toxin is available in the steam and then you can inhale it and then you'll be, you'll be, be poisoned uh, by that, by that uh, steam. As I said before, the toxin levels will vary by site and year. So maybe you get lucky one year, there was not a lot of um, toxin present that year, but then the next year it will be different. Um, so, you know, it's it, just like with any other mushroom, the individual tolerance to toxin varies um, by, by person. Uh, and so there are a lot of urban myths and a lot of people online that said that they eat them and they're wonderful. Well, it's a very big risk. This is a matter of death or life and we do not recommend eating this uh, gyromitris. And you'll find this on books online that this gyromitrin is a very toxic. The problem is even if you don't get all the acute symptoms this time, the effects can be cumulative. So we're going back to that idea of this gyromitrum can be carcinogenic. So you may then, after a while, develop some sort of cancer. All right, so just some hints uh, from picking true morales. True morales, remember the hollow stem. If it's not hollow, do not swallow. Now the cap, attachment to the stalk for true morels, especially the Morchella americana and the Morchella angusticipis, they are fused, intergrown. The stalk is attached to the base of the cap. If we're talking, if we're talking about the half free or the half morels, then you'll have the attachment of the cap like halfway or a quarter way uh, into the, the cap, which can be confusing and endowed just leave it behind. Don't take it with you. Always remember that burpa, the false morals in the genus burpa, that cap is attached only at the top of a stalk, so it looks more like a lampshade. If it looks like a lampshade, you're gonna hurt. Do not eat burpas. Now, true morals have a cap that is pitted, not wrinkled, and that's very important, especially for those burpa and also for those gyromitra. And be cautious. That's the best advice that you should learn. Uh, it, when in doubt, just throw it out. Don't take any risks. It's not worth it. The voices of experience. Dr. Lois Tiffany, uh, the mushroom lady here in Iowa State, uh, she had this two very good pieces of advice for anyone that hunt mushrooms. Almost any other kind of mushrooms have been mistaken for morels, and it happens every year. And this is my favorite. There are old mushroom eaters and bold mushroom eaters, but there are no old bold mushroom eaters. And you can 
imagine why is that? If you're interested in learning more, um, Dr. T does uh, have a publication that is a PDF that's free to download um, from the 90s. It's called Morales, False Morales, and Other Cup Fungi. Uh, also, um, Nancy Weber has a Morel Hunter's Companion, a guide to the true and false morales that uh, is focused on mushrooms from Michigan, but they are um, very similar. Now, if you do get one of this ones, just remember that this are from the 90s, and so they have names that are older. Um, and my favorite online one is definitely the Mushroom Expert side. I love that place. It has a lot of good descriptions uh, and a lot of in-depth. If you have a microscope available, if you know how to do a spore print and all those things, the Mushroom Expert will be great. My best advice, as I said, is learn from an expert, join a mushroom club, a society. There's a lot of great book, books and a lot of good field guides out there um, that you can use as resources. Um, we are gonna be releasing a new booklet uh, that is called Safe Mushroom Foraging that is coming up. Uh, we're just finishing up some things. And if you're interested, we also have uh, more information on mushrooms coming up. Um, and there is a safe mushroom foraging virtual workshop. Uh, there will be two or three parts of this one. Uh, and if you join, then you will get a free uh, safe mushroom foraging booklet uh, midsummer. Now in Iowa, um, the sales of wild harvested mushrooms, especially morels, are regulated by the Iowa Department of Inspections and Appeal. And we, Iowa State University, offer certification classes to sell these mushrooms in Iowa. Um, and we have a page that you can check. Normally, the certification classes are uh, late March, early April. Um, and if you become certified, you have to renew your certification every three years. There is also um, a certification program in Nebraska. And if you're interested, um, I can also put you in contact with uh, the person that runs that. As I said, uh, my name is Lina Rodriguez Salamanca. I am mainly a plant pathologist, so I work a lot with plant problems and horticultural crops, trees, and ornamentals. I also help identify mushrooms in the clinic, especially if they are affecting a tree um, and they may cause this tree to fail in the future, then I can identify if that mushroom is a white rotter or a brown rotter. And that's where my interest in mushrooms come from. I also enjoy them very much in the wild. They're wonderful creatures. I don't eat them as much because as I said, they cause me some problems here and there. Um, but that's all that I have for you. And let me know if you have any questions. I'll stop the share now. You know, we All right. have several questions. Caitlin, do you want to go ahead and ask? Uh, no, you can go ahead. I'm actually going to be uh, sending a couple links here in just a second. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Let me scroll up just a little bit so I can start at the top ones. Um, the first one is, so not cooking properly may be uncomfortable, but not really dangerous. And I think she's talking about the true morals. Right, as long as you have identified the true morale properly, making sure that the stem is hollow, the cap is hollow, that you have looked at the mushroom and there's no signs of decay, insect larvae, sliminess that may be caused by bacteria or yeast. Make sure that you're looking at them very carefully. And then as you are ready to get them uh, cooked, make sure that you're cooking them properly that uh, you know, there's no raw spots that may be hard to digest and that may cause you some uh, intestinal discomfort. All right, let's go to the next one. If there is a bad spot, is it okay to cut off that spot and keep the rest? Well, I... Um, it's like when we get a tomato in our garden that may have um, blossom and rot. Just try and cut further from when you're seeing the damage because 
what would cause decay would be bacteria, yeast, or fungi, other fungi eating fungi. Can you believe this? In nature, other fungi eat fungi. We call those microparasites. And they're very tiny, so we will not see them. So when you're seeing the decay on one spot, you have to cut further because the bacteria will be present uh, through, or the fungi will be present, and you won't be seeing those symptoms of decay. So I would say make sure that you're cutting far, far, to include the part that looks decay, but also to make sure that everything that you have, you know, at least I would say two centimeters, a quarter of an inch, uh, and that may end up being too little of the mushroom anyway. So if it's too much of a mushroom, throw it away. Don't don't even think about it. But if it's a large specimen and you're going to be ending, you know, for maybe two thirds of it uh, safely in that, I think you could consider that, but remember, it's always a risk, um, and you have to be especially careful uh, if you're feeding it to ki kids uh, or, you know, older uh, adults. Um, so I, I think I, I will recommend caution. All right, the next question is, are there ways to pick mushrooms with knowledgeable folks to learn to find them and ID them correctly? except not this year because of social distancing. <laughs> right, right. Yes, so um, I know the, uh, the Prairie States uh, Mushroom Club is one avenue that you could um, reach out. I'm not as familiar with the ones in Nebraska, but the one in Iowa, I believe is in um, Eastern Iowa. Uh, they do have a website, they have a newsletter. Um, there, there is, um, pretty much every state uh, does have some sort of mycological society or um, just mushroom uh, experts that get together and um, go out. Sometimes, you know, I, I reach out to some of my, my own colleagues that have a lot more experience than I do when I first started uh, to become interested in, in hunting morels. I never hunted morels in my life, not even in college. And so I found someone that knew very much what they were, went with them. I, I you know, I said, I, I promise I will not disclose your spot. I will not come back here. And he showed me different places. It was a great experience. Um, but you have to, you know, kind of make those connections. Now, in this day and age, there's a lot of groups on Facebook. In fact, I follow the Iowa couple of pages where people kind of report what they're seeing, what, uh, how, how was the hunt. Again, moral hunters are very, um, they won't share the spot with you, but uh, you can try and learn that way. And uh, like I said, really good uh, pocket guides that are available online. The Safe Mushroom Foraging one will be uh, soon available at the um, ISU Extension Store. Um, and if you join us on that webinar, then um, the, the one on May 5th, uh, then you'll get it for free. So that'll be great. All right, the next question is, um, do the, and I'll pronounce it wrong, Verpo? Verpo? Permanent health uh, problems. And I think you partly answered that after this question was asked, but would you tell us again? Yeah, so what we, we know the most about the gyromitras because they, they cause so many problems that then um, the toxin was identified and we know a lot more about gyromitras. When it comes to Verpo, um, as far as I know, it's more of a stomach discomfort, nervous system um, problems. And it, again, will depend on the amount uh, of it that was consumed. Um, but I don't know that they will be permanent, uh, like the gyromitras that could be more of a chronic um, and can develop cancer in the future. All right. The next question is about drying morels in a dehydrator. Are there any concerns about running the dehydrator indoors? They, some people claim that that blows the spores from the mushroom that can harm people. I have heard this concern, not particularly with morels, but when people that are growing indoor um, oysters or oyster mushrooms. So some of the Pleurotus species um, that are available online on kits, they will send you a little bag uh, with a substrate and the bag will also have the mycelia of the mushroom mixed in. Well, the big difference between morels and pleurotus um, or oysters, or oyster mushrooms, 
that come on those kits is that the oyster mushrooms are very prolific spore producers and they there is people a lot of people that do have allergies because it's like if you had imagine pine uh pollen and doors this is how it feels to have that type of mushroom, a, a pleurotus growing indoors, and, and some people do have allergies to it. As far as morels and in the dehydrator, I'm not sure. I, I haven't heard any complaints, um, and for the most part, morchellas are not as big of a sporulators as, as I compare with the oysters, so I am not sure. I, I really, yeah, I'm not sure. Someone else asked, should you soak morels in salt water before preparing them? Hmm, interesting. I never, I never have heard of them. Uh, for the most part, I think I will treat them as you will treat any of your vegetables. Wash your hands, wash them in fresh water. You can uh, use a clean uh, paper towel to get that excess water. Some people actually like to kind of use that to steam them, that, that excess water. I have not heard um, about salt. Um, more than perhaps to actually give it a little bit of flavor, um, but no, I, I... So this person said they had heard the salt water was to help with any insects that might be in them. Hmm. Well, I think the best um, practice to avoid insects is to look at them very um, detailed. Even when you are, you split them in half, you're inspecting them, uh, I, I, Normally, what I have seen so far uh, in terms of insects and larvae has been big enough that I've been able to see them um, clearly, so I'm not sure. Now you got me wondering, I'll, I'll look it up. All right, if anybody else has a question, go ahead and type it. I know Caitlin put in a lot of links and some of those links um, people have said aren't working quite well, so I think Caitlin's probably looking to make sure on those. Yes, I've been messaging back and forth with a couple folks on that. Yes, Julia did catch that uh, the Mushroom Club link is inactive. I know there's a couple other morale ones that are still active on Facebook, so you should just be able to um, test it out in there. I did post the link for the Safe Mushroom Foraging Workshop that Lena did talk about. Um, so that is a little bit.ly link, so you should just have to copy and paste that over into another tab for your browser if you want to sign up for that. I know we did just have um, one person from in here sign up for it. Uh, Lena's evaluation for the presentation today is also in that message that I sent as well. And then I also did just add in the, the press release that was out about the certification workshop. Um, I know the classes were, um, they were canceled for this year that were supposed to be in March, but you can still learn a little bit about what those um, workshops are for. So I'll go ahead and put those in there again for you. And yes, please, I look forward to hearing um, comments in the survey, uh, especially what you like, what you didn't like, what else you want to learn for mushrooms and, and such. So please let me know. Does anybody have any other questions for Lena for today? Awesome. Lots of people are thanking you for a great presentation here, Lena.